So we're going to, to uh, talk about disease states. I'm going to talk a little bit about the low-risk cancers now, how we'll treat them. Uh, Felix Feng is going to talk a little bit about radiation therapy. We're lucky to have Leonard Marks from our sister institution, UCLA, here. Um, and how when from UCSF. I've, I've constructed three cases here, which uh, I think are the common questions I get in this low risk uh, category. And again, just a low risk of this is these organ confined, lower grade tumors, 3-3, three, three, sometimes low volume, 3-4. Generally, these are lower PSAs. Again, PSA density we've shown here in other places, a, a PSA density below 0.15 is very, uh, favorable. These are generally low capra, zero through two, some three. And this might ra actually uh, uh, be as high as 40% of the men currently being diagnosed in the United States today. So this lowest population, especially in heavy, heavily screened populations, is a very, very big uh, group. So the first case, and, and this, is a, this is a case of, of, of mine uh, managed by myself and Dr. Shinohara, is a 63-year-old man, healthy, presented with a PSA of 6.3, MRI showed a pyrads 4 lesion at the right mid-gland, seen on ultrasound here. Sorry about the MR here. I actually, this was sent to me, but again, we see an ultrasound, an MRI overlapping, an image. Uh, systematic biopsy shows Gleason 3-3, three, three, right mid-gland, two cores, 50%. 20% of the tissue involved. This is a target, a systematic and a targeted biopsy done by Ketsudu. Um, and um, again, we see 3334 three, three, uh, in the right mid gland and base. A fusion targeted biopsy, again, a targeted biopsy showed 3334 three, three, and two cores, 50% of each core. So the targeted biopsy identified the uh, uh, site of disease. The question I get asked frequently is, well, look, uh, if I only have cancer in one part of my prostate, why do you need to treat the entire prostate, the so-called male lumpectomy? This whole issue of focal therapies, both here and elsewhere, has uh, gaining a lot of traction. And I'm, I've asked Leonard Marks to talk about this. These are the questions I gave him to address. Uh, Leonard, thank you for being here. Thank you, Peter. What, what an amazing meeting. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, we got interested uh, in, in focal therapy of prostate cancer and active surveillance as well in about 2009. Uh, and, and I would like to uh, disagree slightly with previous speakers. We think the MRI has really changed the world, uh, prostate MRI, but it's tricky. And uh, I'm very kind of jingoistic about this. I, I really only have confidence in the ones that are done in our place. We've done about 4,000 uh, prostate MRIs starting in 2009. We've built a huge business for the radiologists at, at UCLA. It breaks my heart. I would love to bring ultrasound back as the, uh, as the uh, standard and actually we're looking at this very carefully there's just parenthetically there's a new ultrasound technology called micro ultrasound our our standard uh, heads are uh, 7 megahertz and a company in Toronto has a, a 29 megahertz head which gives enormous detail we'll be starting a, a, a study on that soon I would love to replace MRI but but for now, the, the uh, American Neurological Association and the Society of Abdominal Radiology have both endorsed uh, prostate MRI when it's available in, in, in experienced hands uh, to use this in cases of uh, missed, apparently missed prostate biopsies after a prior, prior negative biopsy. Uh, we are, have a publication that'll be coming out in, in JAMA surgery uh, next week showing that even in first time biopsies, MRI is very good. The cost effect of it is not clear, but we, we think that since we've been able to uh, identify prostate cancer for the first time uh, reliably to see it, not every case, but about 80% of important prostate cancers are clearly seen on MRI, uh, and uh, we think that the next, the next horizon we're rapidly approaching it, is that if we can put a biopsy needle specifically into this lesion right here, why not use the same technology to ablate it? The type of energy is not 100% uh, clear yet which will be used, but we think that perhaps the going forward, the number of patients requiring radiation or surgery will be uh, reduced to approximately 20% of all, that active surveillance will be uh, important for about 40%, and that focal therapy uh, is growing like topsy. The uh, currently the most 
a rapidly growing uh, uh, management strategy is active surveillance, thanks to Dr. Carroll's work and that of others. Uh, but focal therapy is catching up, and in the not too distant future, is going to be a very important thing to have a discussion with. Uh, there, these are the, as I see it, the five compelling reasons to think about focal therapy. First, we can localize prostate cancer. This is a, a high-quality, multi-parametric MRI showing the lesion anatomically on two-two weighted imaging, and uh, in a diffusion weighted imaging, uh, which is functional information telling how dense this, this tissue is. Apparent diffusion uh, coefficient uh, measures a, a similar. Uh, factor quantifies the DWI and diffuse dynamic contrast enhancement, which measures how quickly contrast material moves into and out of the suspected lesions. Uh, but now that we can see these tumors, the whole world has changed. Uh, we had, didn't have this until the past five or 10 years, really. Focal therapy works in many other cancers. Uh, breast is, of course, the, the uh, hallmark comparison, but, but, but uh, many other solid malignancies are treated by segmental resection, uh, thyroid, um, liver, et cetera, et cetera. So it works in other cancers. Um, the efficacy of whole organ therapy for prostate cancer has been called into question by a number of international randomized clinical trials, big, big trials. Uh, our, our holy grail of radical prostatectomy may not be as holy as we uh, previously have thought it was, although it certainly helping a lot of people. Uh, uh, the monoclonal index origin of prostate cancer is another reason to think about this. This has uh, been promulgated uh, by Hashima Med at, uh, in London. Uh, it, the concept is that there may be multiple tumors in the prostate, but one is the mother tumor which drives metastatic potential. If we can knock out the mother, we've done the patient some good. And safety and patient preference is so important. The first words uttered today in this introducing this was Stan Rosenfeld's words that patient preferences have to be taken into consideration. We've had a lot of talks with the FDA uh, in a uh, uh, commercial aspect about getting a new, a new laser product approved and um, the FDA is planning to incorporate patient preferences for approval of new drugs and new devices. So you can't ignore this. Patient preference is very, very important. As someone who sits in the trenches every day and listens to men trying to make a decision about how to treat their localized prostate cancer, uh, patient preferences weigh very heavily here. The ideal candidates for focal therapy, in my opinion, and this is still early, but we think the man should have a focal lesion as shown right here in his prostate. He should have Gleason 7 intermediate risk disease. We don't want to do this in high risk individuals. We don't want to do this in Gleason 6 uh, tumors because uh, they don't need treatment. and. Um, by and large, they don't. And the size of the prostate is a limiting factor. Uh, you, the te current technologies that are available uh, are only really appropriate for prostates around 50 cc's or less. The, uh, we've got the MR guided biopsy for localization, and I want to point out, um, I, um, and I agree wholeheartedly with what Matt Cooperberg said, uh, MRI is not the sine qua non. You, it's not the, the bottom line entirely. Uh, we, if we see this lesion on the uh, MRI, the, and I send, or this man gets sent to the radiologist for an in-bore prostate biopsy, they're going to put a couple needles in this area right there and forget about it, because they believe that this is what, what you have to do. However, uh, if we're considering focal therapy, I want to see a good template grid or mapping biopsy of this man's prostate so that I not only know where the prostate is, the tumor is, but I know where it is not. And that's an important uh, determinant. Uh, we want to follow these patients just as though they're in active surveillance. Some people call focal therapy super surveillance, and that's not a, a bad uh, word for it because we don't know the long-term outcome. Uh, uh, at our place, all of our patients in focal therapy, we've done a few hundred now, uh, are in a observational 
final clinical trial. We have a protocol. They all get follow-up biopsies uh, at six months to determine whether we have achieved our goal, and again at 18 months to see if we have altered the natural history of the disease. Uh, this is uh, the FDA's uh, plan of this for approving new focal therapy products. Uh, the optical, optimal treatment method, I must say, is not known. There are uh, two on, on the market now ways to do focal therapy of prostate cancer. One is by uh, cryotherapy, which really is an old technology, dates uh, for the first FDA approval in 1991. It requires to be done in the operating room under general anesthesia. Most appropriate is a hemi-gland cryoablation. This is not highly uh, focused. It is, it is um, uh, great for taking out half the prostate, which has very little morbidity uh, compared to whole gland therapies. It is uh, covered by by Medicare and most insurances, uh, and it is uh, FDA approved. So, so this is the first one that was on the market. It's, we still do this regularly. Uh, the fact that it's covered by Medicare is a big advantage, and you can do a little larger prostates with this than you can with the competing uh, technology, which is newer newer in the United States at least, high intensity focused ultrasound. This has been used in Europe and Japan uh, for more than 20 years. Lots of uh, available data. The, the uh, governmental systems in, in Japan and Europe uh, pay for HIFU, not so in the United States until very recently. Uh, this also requires an operating room and deep general anesthesia. This must be full paralytic endotracheal anesthesia. If they move even a little bit, it throws off the, uh, co the registration and you, you have to start over again. So this is very, very precise. Uh, this treats a focus of tissue about the size of a grain of rice um, and uh, brings it to a boiling point. When the uh, uh, ultrasound beams go through the body wall, they are diffused and there's no heat generated. But when they come to a point, there's a boiling uh, temperature reached and uh, and the tissue is destroyed. Very, very precise. It uh, has been a cash paying business for, for uh, since its inception and up until its FDA approval uh, two years ago, it still mostly is. Medicare has issued a facility code for it. So what used to cost a patient, if you're a Medicare patient, what used to cost you $25,000, uh, now at least at our place, there is a, a, a plan to ask the patient for $5,000 in cash and the rest is covered by Medicare. So this is, uh, is uh, partly open the floodgates. Insurance still do doesn't pay for it. Uh, so many thousands of men were treated for $25,000 in cash outside the United States um, uh, by a United States company uh, before it became FDA approved. So there is a, a big demand for this service. Their FDA approval was in October of 2015, a very interesting negotiated settlement. They don't have an approval for the treatment of prostate cancer. The company is called Sonoblate. There's a competing uh, French company called Ablatherm. Uh, nobody's done a head-to-head -head trial. I don't know which is best. We use Sonoblate because it's an American company. We were involved in their clinical trials. Uh, but. Um, uh, it has an FDA indication for ablation of prostate tissue, but not for treatment of prostate cancer. So that is an important distinction. Uh, biopsy of these patients, both before and after, I think is very important. Uh, this is a mock-up of, um, of a prostate with a MRI visible lesion here, and we the biopsies uh, target this area. And as I said before, we do uh, all over the prostate to be sure we've mapped the rest of the prostate, know where to go. Uh, six months after treatment in every patient, we bring them back, get another MRI. Usually the MRI visible lesion has disappeared. We go back to that same spot, biopsy that very carefully, uh, uh, targeted fashion because we know where to go. The, the uh, image fusion device saves the spatial locations of these biopsy uh, cores. We know just where to go. We're only interested at six months, did we accomplish our goal? Uh, we're, we're only doing this
this on intermediate risk prostate patients, and nobody's going to get in trouble in six months. Uh, by the way, I have, uh, we have a, a, a YouTube channel, targetedprostatebiopsy.com, which contains um, 10 or 15 short video clips about this, this work and related work. So I uh, call that to your attention. Um, the, um, at 18 months, as I say, we're going to go back and biopsy not only this side, but the other side as well to be sure that we've truly altered the natural history of the disease. So this is, this is early on, but, but we think we are, and in our, uh, we published just recently a, a series on men who had undergone hemigland cryoablation, uh, and the uh, absence of cancer here was about 80% using this very, uh, very comprehensive technology and for a treatment which doesn't alter quality of life. Uh, this is 80% uh, I think is great. 10% were uh, failures and 10% had a little bit of Gleason 6s that we're going to still follow. Uh, these are, we want to see data on this. This is the best available data from my uh, colleague Hashima Med's group in uh, England. These are, this shows the various types of spot therapies, hemiglands, cryo, hockey stick, etc. cetera. Uh, all of this can be done using the kind of guidance that I showed, but this is the, the uh, best available data, 625 men, uh, all with clinically significant prostate cancer, treated at various sites in the UK, uh, with 56-month median follow-up, uh, two rectal fistulas, which is a terrible complication, but it's we pretty much uh, uh, just learned how to avoid that. No cases of incontinence. And at this 56-month follow-up period, a 98% failure-free survival rate, I would like to say that biopsy was only done in 222 of these patients, a third of them, which is, a, in my opinion, a problem with these data. But the biopsy was negative in the majority of those who did get biopsied, and nobody developed metastatic disease or needed additional treatment. So, so we've come a long way in this focal therapy business. It really did start with, in the United States at least, with Bernard Fisher, general surgeon in breast cancer, uh, who did clinical trials in the 1970s uh, comparing um, mastectomy, radical mastectomy with lumpectomy, and his colleagues rewarded him for that trial by saying lumpectomy is murder, equivalent to malpractice. Contrast that with this court case, which, uh, w which was seen some 20 or 30 years later, where a mo New York fashion model underwent a mastectomy for breast cancer, was cured, but her career, of course, was ended, and she then sued her doctor on the basis that there was no discussion of any other treatment, and a New York jury awarded her millions of dollars in a settlement. So we've gone some, uh, from a time where lumpectomy or focal therapy is murder to a time when if you don't discuss it with your patient, you could get in trouble. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. What a wonderful conference Merrill and her colleagues have put together. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a lot of new technology rushing into space, new forms of, uh, of uh, treatment, uh, you know, uh, high pressure water vapor, uh, uh, interstitial laser, so it remains to be seen. I want to move quickly here to another case we commonly see. This is a 58 year old man, uh, P a baseline PSA of 7.1, ultrasound 35 cc's, T2 lesion on ultrasound, systematic biopsy, at least in 3 3 identifying 4 of 12 cores, left base, right apex, right base, between 20 and 60 percent of each core involved. This is a very common case we see uh, at UCS. Uh, and these are questions for Dr. Wynn to address on, is this patient a candidate for surveillance Ohio? Uh, thank you, uh, Peter, for the uh, question. So we uh, detect uh, about 40 percent, 30 percent of the patient that we did uh, biopsy on end up with low risk disease like this. The, the question is, uh, First is, uh, will this patient is a good candidate for active surveillance or not? You know, based on the, the organ confined disease and the low, uh, the low volume cancer, he's, he could be a candidate for active surveillance. The, uh, the, uh, as mentioned before, PSA density is a very good uh, indicator of progression. So the only uh, adverse uh, value on this patient is the PSA density of 0.2. So I think this patient will, these other factors that we'll need to take account uh, into 
whether this patient needs uh, additional risk assessment to, and whether he will fit uh, into the, uh, uh, as a candidate for active surveillance. And the goal of active surveillance is uh, when I counsel patient is, is all about picking the right time to treat the cancer. And, the, and we, we want to avoid or delay the cost, uh, functional or monetary, of the treatment without sacrificing or compromising uh, a chance of curing the cancer later. And also, uh, complying with screening, you know, reduce overtreatment of, of prostate cancer. And the, the, the premise of active surveillance has to have uh, real, ra, 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 the, the, the initial assessment has to be reasonably accurate. And also, mon uh, the, how we monitor the, the cancer mm -hmm. throughout the life of the patient has to be also accurate and, and act when we see any sign of progression so we don't miss a chance of curing the cancer. Um, so how do, how do we do it? So the, uh, the way we do it is that we have to monitor three things for patient. PSA, the cancer gray, any changes in the cancer gray, or, or changes in cancer stage or the size of the cancer. So we check PSA every three to six months. Uh, we would typically uh, repeat the biopsy, what we we'll call a confirmatory biopsy within 12 months and then uh, two or three years after that. And I image uh, these patients with ultrasound every six months or twice a year to evaluate the size of the tumor or the stage and also get some patient uh, may need uh, an addition of an MRI if I don't see anything on ultrasound or some uh, additional uh, 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 genetic uh, or risk assessment using uh, profiling of the tumor. And uh, treatment should be considered if we see changes in the cancer gray or the stage or, or both. Now, uh, so how likely is the, to that patient needs treatment while they're on active surveillance? So this is uh, the data from UCSF of more than uh, 1,600 men on active surveillance. As you see on the, uh, uh, the X axis, uh, the men that uh, does not need treatment. So by, by uh, five years, about half of the, the men may have a change in their cancer grade and need treatment. And the, the um, survival, uh, if you look at overall survival, is 98% and 100% prostate cancer specific survival. So <laughs> no one died from uh, active surveillance of five years in our uh, cohort of more than 1,500 men. Now, the concern about this patient is that uh, all concern for the physician as well is that could we miss uh, clinically significant cancer from that first biopsy. And in this patient, the PSA density may be an indicator of that. So for a patient like this, I would get uh, uh, an MRI to see if we miss any cancer that was not discovered on a random biopsy. And also, he, he may benefit from genomic uh, profiling of the tumor for a more personalized uh, risk assessment. So uh, MRI, uh, I think uh, you've heard a lot about, uh, which you know, if we can identify uh, a lesion that could be clinically significant, uh, typically I would biopsy that within six months from the initial biopsy. If the MRI doesn't show anything significant, usually the confirmatory biopsy, I would push it out to a year or so. Uh, so the MRI give us some of that uh, uh, risk assessment as well. And uh, also, it allows us to, to use it as a target for MRI fusion. So usually a confirmatory biopsy, I would integrate the MRI in there to offer the patient an MRI fusion biopsy in our active surveillance. Uh, patients, because um, so PIRAT 4 or 5 is a, is a, 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 click, a significant predictor for adverse uh, pathology as well as progression. Um, the, obviously, the concern about MI is the cost and then insurance and also the variation in, in interpretations and access. Some uh, area may not have access to MI. So in those cases, we add, you know, we add other uh, biomarkers such as the 4K uh, test or the uh, uh, PHI, these are looking at uh, uh, the probability of the patient having a high-grade cancer. So you can, and then also 
the biopsy, what we can use, uh, get more information from the biopsy, the initial biopsy. The, we can send a, a biopsy for a genomic test, such as the decipher, Polaris, or the oncotype. And, the, uh, and these tests may add another layer of, of uh, discrimination in, in which patient may harbor more aggressive cancer. So about 14% you know, of the low-grade uh, low cancer, at least in six, may harbor aggressive mutation, and we want to identify this patient out early on, maybe offer early treatment or more close uh, uh, surveillance. Um, so uh, we've showed this slide before. As you can see here, a, a patient with a CAPRA 2, you know, the chance of a favorable, favorable uh, pathology is, is about 60%, uh, but, but it can range to 80 to 30%. So we want to identify the CAPRA 2 patient who has a high GPS or high, uh, uh, that may harbor high-risk mutations uh, these patients may need more uh, f uh, closer follow-up or, or early treatment, uh, uh, or offer early treatment. So, uh, in summary, this uh, for this patient, the the PSA density, or PSA divided by the volume of the, the prostate, is high. So this patient will need additional risk assessment before I would offer him uh, active surveillance. And, and uh, the use of MRI in this patient may be of value, as well as a genomic profiling of that uh, tumor on the initial biopsy. Um, you know, active surveillance, uh, as you can see, our data of more than 1,600 men are, are very safe, and, and they, including young patients uh, or patients with low volume Gleason 4 in selected cases, uh, could be an option. And it's, it's, it's now the preferable method for patients with low risk disease is active surveillance. And uh, you hear later from June Chan about what you can do uh, on surveillance. You can change your diet and exercise, and that will uh, maybe uh, improving or slow down the progression. So you hear that uh, later. Um, so. Thank you very much. Uh, our uh, surveillance cohort is actually 2,200 patients. The treatment rates at five years are 30%, 50% by 10 years. I'm going to wrap it up with this last case. We're going to go pretty quickly here. It used to be when I started, we'd ask only a few questions about radiation. You know, it'd be eight weeks with or without hormonal therapy. That's changed. So here's a patient, a 55 year old man, a PSA of 8.1. MRI, ultrasound, fusion biopsy, three, four, and four cores on the left, uh, three, four on the right, uh, target two cores. MRI shows a pyrads four lesion left base, pyrads five uh, right mid gland. Again, this is a three, three, four, kind of a intermediate risk, a low intermediate risk category. No bone abnormalities, organ confined, low, low lymph node involvement. And I had a long list of questions for Felix because it, the field of radiation oncology now is much more complex, many different treatment options in combination with or without hormonal therapy. So Felix will bring it home here. I'll, I'll bring it home. We're running a little bit over, so I'll be brief, but I'll be around for lunch uh, if anybody wants to ask questions. And so I want to begin with an overview of radiation uh, therapy approaches. Um, so as many of you know, radiation is frequently given using x-rays delivered from outside of the patient. That's called external beam radiation therapy. Um, and the, the, the terminology varies a little bit, but intensity modulated radiation therapy is conventionally given as daily radiation, Monday through Friday, uh, for many weeks. Uh, nowadays, we have a newer approach called stereotactic body radiation therapy, which is five treatments of high dose radiation over two weeks. And so that's all radiation from the outside. Radiation can also be given via implantation of radioactive sources into the prostate. That's called brachytherapy. And that can be given via high dose rate or HDR brachytherapy or low dose rate or LDR brachytherapy. And so it turns out that, as Peter mentioned, um, there are many different radiation therapy approaches for patients. So for patients with low-risk prostate cancer, we try to treat with one approach, either brachytherapy alone or intensely modulated radio th radiation therapy alone or stereotactic body radiation alone. We try to just get away with one approach. It's cleaner, it's simpler, it's more convenient. For intermediate risk patients, it turns out that now there's actually more favorable intermediate risk or uh, unfavorable intermediate risk, which is a little bit more aggressive. And so the spectrum ranges from monotherapy with uh, these three approaches to combination brachytherapy with IMRT or SBRT with IMRT. And again, um, we tailor that based on the disease characteristics. 
And then with high-risk prostate cancer nowadays, we're, uh, we're basically looking at either a combination therapy or, um, uh, you know, or IMRT itself. And given this particular patient's uh, features, he's Gleason 3 plus 4, PSA less than 10, I'd recommend monotherapy with either brachytherapy, IMRT, or SBRT. Now, another question Peter posed is, should this patient receive androgen deprivation therapy? Now, in general, I recommend a short course of androgen deprivation therapy, four to six months, for patients with unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer, but no androgen deprivation for patients with favorable intermediate risk. This patient's actually right on the border just because he had a large volume of disease, a uh, number of positive cores, so I would discuss the pros and cons of ADT, and oftentimes it's an individualized choice on the, uh, uh, by the patient. I'd also consider ordering a genomic test to cipher as I tend to use these assays for tiebreakers. Peter also asked, should a rectal spacer be placed? So nowadays, uh, um, when Dr. Shinohara is putting in our gold marker seeds for, uh, for treatment, he can also basically put in a, what we call a rectal spacer, which is kind of a, I think of it as a foam type device, and it basically separates out the rectum um, from, the, uh, from the prostate, puts some space in between. It actually makes a difference because nowadays we come up with very, very tight radiation plans where we're trying to uh, radiate the prostate shown here in the red area. Uh, and minimize the radiation dose to the surrounding area. One of the more important organs that we think about is the rectum, which is outlined down here. And so putting a spacer in, there's a spacer in on both of these cases, it basically limits the high dose radiation that sees the rectum. And it turns out that the, the rectal spacers significantly uh, uh, not only decrease radiation dose to the rectum, but they've been shown to improve rectal toxic toxicity rates on a prospective randomized trial. Um, Mac over here will tell us, well, what is the clinical, how much is enough to warrant putting in the spacer, and I think that's an area that's still under investigation. Uh, what are the complications associated with radiation? Well, here you can see the short-term and long-term side effects associated with radiation, and they mostly focus around urinary or gastrointestinal side effects because the bladder is in front of the prostate and the rectum is behind the prostate. But you know, looking at uh, stereotactic body radiation therapy, this is a pooled analysis of 6,000 patients from 38 prospective trials that, that we recently published. And you know, the long-term uh, rates for, 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 grade, uh, for high-grade toxicity is about 1% 1, 1%, uh, for you know, gastrointestinal, about 0.2% for genital urinary. And so overall, these are uh, actually pretty well-tolerated treatments. Last question, uh, Peter always likes to uh, having the answer is, does radiation provide long-term treatment durability? And the answer is yes. And so this is a randomized trial that was published of surgery versus radiation versus active monitoring uh, for prostate cancer-specific survival and freedom from uh, disease progression. And the main point here is just to show that even at 10 years out, we're doing all right. And that's why at UCSF, we have a multidisciplinary clinic with Peter, myself, Mac, uh, um, Matt, uh, Howe, where uh, many of our patients will see both a surgeon and a radiation oncologist, so just so we can discuss treatment options. But overall, yes, I think radiation uh, can provide long-term durability. And that's it, Peter. I, I think we've taken our time. I, I just want to say a few things. We're not talking about uh, many, my, uh, ask why we're not talking about surgery for the management of low-risk cancer. We're a very high-volume surgical center, continue to be so, but only 8% of our patients uh, who get operated on here at UCS have Gleason 3-3 disease, and those are usually genetically aberrant, higher-volume tumors. Something's driving that decision. Most of those patients can be treated by other forms uh, of treatment, so we're a big believer in surveillance. We've shown that. I think the benefit to surgery is we've seen in higher-risk patients where there could be a uh, sur survival advantage. The other thing I think it's important for us to realize is when you go to see your doctor about, about uh, experience, you need to ask that doctor what their experience is and people like you and how do they know that. And uh, here at UCSF, we, for every man I've operated on, we track their outcomes over time. So we can show the results from other places, but we can show the results from UCSF, and that may differ compared to other published uh, literature, usually uh, quite favorably. Eric, I think to stay on time, we may... Jump in, Peter, a yeah. little bit. Uh, you know, Peter won't say this because he's one of the more humble guys around, but, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of surgeons, and, you know, I think that looking at the individual surgeon outcomes are, is, is quite impressive, and, you know... Um, our team at UCSF, but also I'm, I'm sure Dr. Marks, you, you want to go to a surgeon who operates on a lot of prostates uh, when, you, when you're getting surgery for prostate cancer. <laughs>